A Cold War heater with a sketchy past coming up. What is up guys, my name is John with pewpewtactical.com, your definitive source for gun reviews, gear guides, and all things that go bang. We don't usually stray too far into the historical side of firearms here on our channel, as there are a lot of folks out there who are going to nail that content with a greater depth, but occasionally the opportunity does arise to play with some kind of cool, less common guns, so we figured what's the harm? In this particular instance, we're taking a look at the Walther P1, which is a descendant of the iconic P38, which was issued to a good chunk of the various armed forces of Nazi Germany in the lead up to and during World War II. Previously, the German military sidearm needs had been filled by the Luger P08. And while the Luger was by no means a bad pistol by any means, in true German fashion, it was a bit needlessly complicated, especially when you're planning to outfit a military gearing up to start a second global bar fight. Considering that sidearms were not a crucial part of the Third Reich's military doctrine, it made sense to instead adopt a pistol that could be mass-produced at a cheaper per unit cost than the Luger. As the P-08 required both significant labor hours and craftsmanship to create at the scale needed to sate the Wehrmacht's demands. The P-38 entered development in the mid-30s, and by the time the design was finalized and operational, could be produced for approximately 32 Reichsmarks. And while conversion rate information for dead Nazi money is sort of ambiguous, it appears as though that'd be about 14 US dollars. Using the same conversion, that works out to about $5 less than the Luger's 19 US dollars cost per unit. Adjusted for inflation and scaled up to the approximate million units produced between 1938 and 1945, and it's easy to see how you've got a massive chunk of change saved by switching over to the P-38. The P-38 was also an improvement over the Luger in a few areas as well. The gun was one of the first semi-automatic double-action pistols ever fielded, meaning that users could safely carry the gun with a round in the chamber and the hammer down. The Allied aerial bombing campaigns that brutally targeted German industrial manufacturing centers took its toll on the P-38's production and distribution schedule, however. And the primary Walther plant, located in Zellamelis, was eventually captured by American soldiers and later destroyed by the Soviets in 1946. While nearly 1.2 million P-38s were produced during the war, they never quite replaced the Luger entirely. Fritz Walther and his brothers had actually set up shop in a brand new factory located in Ulm in southwest Germany. They were sort of lying low and just producing home goods for a while, but with an anticipation that an eventual West German defense force would probably need to consult Walther for their firearm making prowess at some point in the future. And as it turns out, they were correct. In 1956, the West German government announced the formation of the Bundeswehr, which is the modern German army as we know it. Shortly after, German authorities began soliciting designs for the Bundeswehr's standard issue sidearm. The Walther brothers had managed to save both patent details and some surviving wartime P-38s, and after a trial, the P-38 was once again selected to outfit the German military. The new production P-38s were dubbed the P-1 and utilized an aluminum alloy frame instead of the P-38's heavier steel. They eventually saw a switch to Bakelite hand grips as well. So where does that leave us today? Weirdly enough, the Walther P-1 specifically imported by PW Arms is on California's roster of state approved handguns. Since the Crown kindly consented to our ownership of this cool little Milsert blaster, we snagged one pretty much just for funsies from guns.com, who nicely double checked that it was indeed from PW Arms. Shooting the P1 is a little bit of a strange experience, but not necessarily in a bad way. Right off the bat, it's going to be quite obvious that this is a little bit of an antiquated firearms design, but there are some surprising familiar trappings of modernity within it. First things first, we were unfortunate enough to be hit by a pretty gnarly dust storm when we went out to put some rounds through this bad boy, so you'll have to excuse my sort of homeless Borderlands cosplay thing I've got going on here. Dust fucking sucks. I don't like sand. It's coarse, rough. My guts are everywhere. The P1 is overall pretty comfy and fits my hand reasonably well. Though you'll likely notice that the steel slide sitting on top of an alloy frame makes the gun feel a bit top heavy. The fire controls are surprisingly modern and it's pretty obvious that Beretta wound up taking a good amount of design cues on the M9 from the P1 and P38. 
The safety and decocker sit on the left side of the gun and are reasonably accessible with a thumb flick, allowing you to chamber around and safely drop the hammer if you'd like to carry the gun hot. The slide release sits a little bit further forward and kind of simultaneously feels too large and too small at the same time, but I'll explain. When the slide is locked, finding and manipulating the slide release feels a little bit fumbly. Overall, it's got a little bit of a smaller profile than what you would find on a modern handgun, and it also sits right above this thumb groove on the pistol grip that kind of gets in the way if you're attempting to manipulate it with just your thumb. However, because of my weak side hand placement when shooting, I found that I was actually riding the slide release more or less constantly, which obviously prevented the slide from locking open on the last round. That isn't really a fair criticism of the pistol itself, however, because it was developed well before shooting a handgun with two hands was anywhere near a commonplace practice. As mentioned above, the gun can be fired in a double action mode if you don't mind creeping through that long ass trigger pull. But the single action trigger pull is quite smooth with minimal creep, a very obvious breaking point, and a clean reset. It's been said that this is not a particularly forgiving handgun, but if you concentrate on the fundamentals while shooting it, it should do its job. I definitely found myself needing to slow down to take accurate shots, and the angry desert wind certainly didn't help things. But I also felt like I warmed up to the P1 pretty quickly, feeling reasonably confident with close-up steel after a few mags or so. Notably, the gun's got the classic European-style magazine release at the heel of the magwell itself. You'll need to press back on the large tab on the bottom of the pistol grip to release the mag, which is obviously quite different to the trigger guard thumb releases we're probably all used to as Americans. While that might be a little bit unfamiliar and weird to get used to, I'm hesitant to criticize the design because, in our opinion, this is just a fun conversation piece and plinker, and not something you would probably ever use in a self-defense situation. Admittedly, it is a little bit weird, but if you find yourself getting killed because you couldn't reload your Cold War Relic handgun fast enough, you've probably already made a series of questionable decisions, so... The mag itself holds eight rounds of 9x19, just like the P08. It's single stack, solidly built, and we had no trouble loading rounds by hand. It's worth noting that anecdotal internet evidence suggests that these guns are not rated for plus P or plus P plus self-defense rounds, and we'll go ahead and assume that someone injured themselves in the process of coming to that conclusion. And on that note, this is actually a slightly later model P1 that has some interesting design alterations that are not found on the early P1s or P38s. The switch over to an aluminum frame brought with it a few issues regarding wear and tear on where the frame contacts and engages the locking block, and a hex bolt has been added to alleviate this issue. Additionally, later model P1s are going to have a fatter slide a fix introduced to mitigate apparent issues with slides cracking or stretching that may have been related to the higher pressure 9mm ammunition that became common after World War II. The fatter slide P1 is easily identifiable by the serrations near the safety and decocker that extend a bit forward of the safety markings themselves. Thinner P1 slides only have serrations to the rear of the safety assembly. The gun slide is surprisingly easy to manipulate, and the action is pretty smooth. Being a little bit more used to the recoil springs found on Glocks, the P1 is downright buttery in comparison, though we did have a couple of issues while shooting it. The P1 ran through an entire box of Blazer 115 grain ball ammo with absolutely no issues, but switching over to American Eagle ball began producing some bizarre failures to extract that jammed up the gun due to the pressure the slide exerted on the magazine. These failures to extract were a little bit odd in that it looked like the gun started to extract the casing but lost its hold on it for whatever reason, thus leaving a partially extracted spent cartridge bound up in the action as the gun's slide returned and attempted to chamber another live round. The slide's relative ease of operation proved to be super useful here, as I was able to bring the slide rearward with one hand, just enough to take pressure off of the magazine, drop the mag, and clear the malfunction. We've never really had any issues with AE ammo previously, so we're not really sure what the problem was here, but it did seem to be specifically limited to American Eagle ammo. But we're also not particularly surprised that a Milserp gun that'd be eligible for an AARP discount at Denny's if it were a person might be a little bit picky on what type of ammo you feed it for arbitrary and esoteric reasons. The P1 also includes the P38's loaded chamber indicator 
providing a visual aid to the shooter via a small pin that extends to the rear when a round is chambered and the gun is hot. It's a pretty neat feature and it's certainly ahead of its time, but overall it's kind of one of those classic pieces of German over-engineering. Realistically, you don't need something that complicated to achieve the same effects. So this is something that sort of died with the P1 and P38. However, far more features found on the P1 and P38 did continue on into the future, such as the safety and decocker, the double action trigger, and the locking block that are all conspicuously found on the US government's Beretta M9 pistols. I've said it before, but I'm a pretty big history nerd, and so firearms with any sort of historical value or importance have always been a bit fascinating to me. It's pretty cool to have the opportunity to put some rounds through what realistically is kind of a snapshot frozen in time of handgun evolution as a whole, where you can see all of these small features that wound up in literally modern military handguns, but in a gun that is half a century old. If you find yourself in a similar mindset, I probably don't have to tell you that the P1 is a pretty cool toy that you'll likely have just as much fun with as I did. That being said, in our opinions, this is still very much a novelty gun or a fun range toy, and certainly not anything that we would recommend carrying or using for any sort of practical defensive situation. Although I'm positive that we are going to get at least one dissertation down in the comment section below where someone will make that their personal hill to die on. That does bring up a bigger question that we did want to toss to all of you though. We very much wanted to know if you all have any interest in us actually doing a little bit more content on historical firearms every now and then. It's not gonna be a mainstay of the channel. It is an interest of ours and we enjoy producing the content. So if you enjoy watching it, we certainly have no issues with doing more of it in the future. To be clear, it's not gonna be anything as crazy as what Ian with Forgotten Weapons does, but if you like it, let us know below. All right, guys, that's gonna do it for us today. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this content, go ahead and subscribe to the channel as we've got lots more, maybe, reviews of historical firearms on the way. Once again, my name is John with Pew Pew Tactical and we will see you next time.